Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's Side by Science webinar. Today's webinar has three parts. We're joined by Erin Riggs of the ACMG CNV Interpretation Working Group Steering Committee. Erin has been instrumental in helping us implement the guidelines on our automated platform, and we're extremely happy to have her sharing her expertise with us today. Erin is going to start the webinar by giving us an overview of the guidelines. Since the guidelines are quite complex, we're going to follow Erin's over overview with a frequently asked questions segment where Erin will clarify some of the more nuanced aspects of the guidelines. Finally, Kristen Sund, our lead scientist, will apply the guidelines in clinical scenarios using Imagine's new automated CNV classification tool. My name is Orit, I'm Imagine's marketing director. Some housekeeping before we get started. Please use the Q&A on the Zoom bar to ask questions. If we don't get to your question, we will answer them either personally or on our blog after the webinar. I'm going to briefly introduce Imagine before handing it over to Erin to get started. So Imagine is working with some of the top genomics institutes in the US and globally to enable high throughput genomics. We combine AI with deep scientific knowledge in order to drive as much automation and efficiency to the complex and often manual process of interpretation. Now, AI is an overly used term today. So just to clarify, we feel strongly that the role of AI in genomics is to reduce noise and highlight data points with the most evidence so that geneticists can come to a quicker and better diagnosis. Our goal is to enable the shortest time possible from genomic data to decisions by applying validated and accurate AI models and utilizing explainable AI to provide up-to-date evidence. I'm not gonna cover all of our technology innovation, but I do wanna highlight our highly accurate automated interpretation algorithms, which provide you with a short list of causative variants, each backed by current evidence from the literature and databases. We also want to make it as easy as possible to adopt and consistently apply the ACMG ClinGen guidelines for the classification of SNVs and CNVs. Our automation offloads much of the work to machines, leaving curators with more time to focus on areas where their clinical judgment is irreplaceable. And on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Erin so we can dive directly into the guidelines for CNVs. Erin, um, you can right. go ahead and share. Thank you. Let me get the screen share set up here. Can you confirm that you see my screen? Yep, perfect. All right, excellent. All right, so as Orit mentioned, my name's Erin Riggs, and I'm a genetic counselor and assistant professor at Geisinger's Autism and Developmental Medicine Institute. And today I'm going to provide you with an overview of the updated ACMG ClinGen technical standards for interpretation and reporting of constitutional CMVs. So variant interpretation requires the synthesis and evaluation of evidence from a variety of sources. And because of this, it can be a somewhat subjective process. We know that labs can be discordant in the interpretation of the same genomic variant. And this is, you know, a universal problem observed for both sequence and copy number variants. It's documented in the medical literature and probably everyone on this webinar has um, observed something like that in their practice. Um, so in an attempt to guide laboratories toward consensus in their interpretation evaluations, interpretation guidelines were developed for both groups. The guidelines for the interpretation of postnatal constitutional copy number variants were first published in 2011. And while they provided guidance on the types of evidence to consider, there were no specific recommendations regarding the relative importance of each in the overall evaluation. Um, so the original CMV interpretation guidelines were due for an update as it had been several years since they were initially published. Those original guidelines were put forth at a time when chromosomal microarray was just coming into wide clinical use. But since that time, we've gathered a lot more data and a lot more experience, which allows us to further refine those previous recommendations. Also, new technologies are requiring us to think beyond just chromosomal microarray. Copy number variants can now be detected via a number of different platforms. So to this end, a working group was established to provide more specific guidance to users regarding the weights of particular pieces of evidence, as well as to align the updated recommendations where possible with the sequence variant interpretation guidelines published by ACMG and AMP in 2015. 
The working group consisted of representatives from both the ACMG Lab QA Committee and ClinGen, which is an NIH-funded initiative dedicated to determining the clinical relevance of genes and variants. The ultimate goal of the updated technical standards is to move toward more consistent, more transparent CMV interpretation across labs, across technologies, and across specialties. The updated technical standards for interpretation and reporting of constitutional CMVs were officially released on November 6, 2019, so almost a year ago now, and include a number of major changes. Briefly, these are officially adopting the 5T or variant classification system put forth in Richards et al., the recommendation to uncouple variant classification from clinical interpretation, and incorporating a quantitative evidence-based evaluation framework into the classification process. Through the remainder of this talk, we'll walk through each of these changes. The first major change is moving from the classification system, which was put forth in Kearney et al., which was essentially a three-tier system, to the five-tier system from Richards et al. The original CMV guidelines grouped the concepts of likely pathogenic and likely benign under the classification of uncertain. Moving these to distinct categories will allow CMV classifications to more closely align with sequence variant interpretations and give the community a consistent set of classification terms. Anecdotally, many, though of course not all, CMV labs were already doing this, so hopefully that transition was relatively straightforward. The next major change is the recommendation to uncouple a variance classification from its clinical significance. And these are really two separate concepts. One is, is there evidence to demonstrate that this variant causes disease in general? And the other is, is this variant causing that disease in my particular patient at this point in time? For example, does the variant explain the reason for referral? Is it an incidental finding? Could it cause disease, but only in trans with another pathogenic variant, such as carrier status? What does this variant mean for the person in front of you? Clearly labeled sections on a report, similar to what's typically found on whole exome sequencing reports, could be utilized to make this more clear. So I'll further illustrate this point with two examples. In the first example, haploinsufficiency of a particular gene on the X chromosome is known to be associated with a particular disease, and we'll just call it disease XYZ. You observe a deletion of this gene in a male case and a similar deletion in a female case. So how should you classify these cases? It's the same variant in both. Should it be classified as pathogenic in the male and something else in the female, like the US or likely benign or benign? The updated technical standards recommend that the variant classification be the same, which is pathogenic, in both scenarios. The variant's the same, the evidence supporting that variant's relationship to disease is the same. What might be different is what this variant means for the patient in front of you, or the clinical significance. For the male, this variant is likely disease-causing. For the female, this variant represents at minimum carrier status, but could also be associated with clinical features. This type of clinical significance information can be conveyed in the clinical report alongside the classification. In the second example, say haploinsufficiency of gene 123 is associated with something like hearing loss. You observe a deletion of this gene in someone who was referred to you for hearing loss, as well as in someone who was referred to you for something seemingly unrelated, like failure to thrive. So how should you classify these cases? Again, it's the same variant in both cases. Should it be classified as pathogenic in the hearing loss case, but VUS in the failure to thrive? Because we don't think this variant is related to failure to thrive? Once again, we can separate the concept of the variant classification from the clinical significance. There's plenty of evidence to support the fact that deletions of this gene can cause hearing loss. That alone gets this variant a classification of pathogenic. In the case that was referred to you for hearing loss, this is straightforward. The variant detected seems to be the quote-unquote answer for the reason for referral. For the other patient, this variant might represent an incidental finding. The patient is at risk for hearing loss based on the information known, and this should be conveyed in the clinical report. It's also possible that the patient is already known to have hearing loss, but this was not reported to you. Either way, this information should be conveyed in the clinical report, along with the fact that a genetic etiology for the original reason for referral was not identified, and additional testing for that indication could be considered. 
why, why do we care about that? Why is making this distinction important? Well, we know it's a major source of discrepancy between laboratories. In one example, variants involving the X chromosome represented almost 20% of the potential conflicts flagged in an analysis of ClinVar CMVs overlapping known dosage sensitive genes. Of uh, these, 85% were due to inconsistencies in the way people classified variants observed in female patients from benign to pathogenic. Anecdotally, we're aware of labs interpreting variants as VUS when the associated disease does not match the reason for referral, regardless of the level of evidence to support the pathogenicity of the particular variant. In addition, this historical practice of changing variant classification based on an individual patient's reason for referral is at odds with the way that sequence variants are often classified. And given that we're becoming better and better at detecting CMVs on certain sequencing-based platforms, it's imperative that CMVs be classified the same way, regardless of the platform on which they are observed. The third major update is the incorporation of a quantitative points-based evaluation framework. This framework is meant to provide more specific guidance to users regarding the weights of particular pieces of evidence in an effort to increase interlaboratory consistency and overall transparency. Where possible, we have attempted to align recommendations with the ACMG AMP sequence variant interpretation guidelines. However, the most important reason for including this scoring framework is to promote, again, that consistency and transparency in the evaluation. The goal is that the system will get people thinking about CMV evaluations in the same manner, checking the same evidence types, et cetera, but most importantly, it'll encourage people to document what went into their classification and why they chose the classification that they did. So in these new technical standards, we've incorporated two independent points-based scoring metrics, one for the evaluation of deletions and another for duplications, as considerations can be different in those two scenarios. A suggested number of points will be added or subtracted for each piece of evidence to reflect the relative strength of that particular piece of evidence. Many of the categories have ranges, and those ranges are provided to allow for flexibility, recognizing that some evidence is stronger than others, even within the same category. The number of points will be totaled and will correlate with the suggested classification. Of course, the classification calculated by the scoring metrics is just a suggestion. Um, the reviewer is always able to adjust the final classification if, in their clinical judgment, there is reason to do so. Over the next few slides will review the general categories of evidence we recommend considering. In the interest of time, we'll go through these rather quickly. And for deletions only, the duplication metric, however, is quite similar. And then Kristen will walk through some examples at the end. So section one is intended to be a quick assessment of genomic content. Are there any protein coding or known functionally important elements within your CMV? If so, the user is directed to work through the rest of the evidence categories, collecting evidence to support or refute pathogenicity. CMVs that are completely void of gene content or only contain repetitive elements or pseudogenes fall into category 1B. In this scenario, there may not be any evidence to interrogate about the genomic region because there's, there's nothing in there. With no evidence supporting or refuting pathogenicity, the default classification should be one of uncertainty, which is reflected in the recommended default score. However, additional information could move the CMV like this toward either pathogenic or benign as appropriate. For example, inheritance information or population data could be used to classify this type of CMV as likely benign or benign. In section two, we ask whether or not the observed CMV overlaps with any established haplon sufficient genes or genomic regions. For the purposes of this guideline, we're defining established haplon sufficient or triple sensitive regions as those with sufficient evidence for dosage sensitivity per the ClinGen dosage sensitivity map, which is a source that evaluates the evidence for dosage sensitivity using a previously published evidence-based evaluation method. This information is all publicly available through the URL at the top of the screen, as well as through our website, clinicalgenome.org. Through this site, you can search by either a specific gene or a range of genomic coordinates, and you can also download all the dosage sensitivity information to use as tracks within your own systems via the FTP site, which is updated nightly. Special considerations may apply when a deletion partially overlaps an established haplosufficient gene. 
briefly to orient you, a known haploinsufficient gene is depicted at the top. The red bars are example deletions representing each scoring category. Note that most of the categories here do include that point range that I mentioned earlier, in addition to the default score. And this is really in order to account for gene-specific differences within this category. So for example, if your deletion overlaps the five prime end of the gene, you might consider downgrading the default number of points if the gene has an alternative in frame methionine, or if an alternatively spliced isoform is not encompassed by the deletion. If your deletion partially overlaps the three prime end of the gene, you might consider downgrading when the resulting protein product is not expected to undergo nonsense media decay. And you might consider upgrading if the involved exons are known to be critical to gene function. Our scoring metrics do also provide guidance for the evaluation of intragenic deletions or duplications within known haploinsufficient genes. This scenario falls within the sequence variant interpretation evidence category PBS1, or predictive variant with predicted null variant within a gene where loss of function is a known mechanism for disease. The ClinGen sequence variant interpretation working group has published a detailed decision-making guide to help determine if a particular variant meets this criterion. For consistency, we recommend also adopting this flowchart and have associated specific point values for use in our metric with the evidence categories at the right. Alternatively, one must consider if the CMV overlaps with established benign genomic regions. So similar to established dosage sensitive regions, we're defining established benign as those that have been curated by the ClinGen dosage sensitivity process. In general, these are gonna be regions that are frequently observed in the general population at a rate of 1% or higher, are not known to be elevated in cases compared to controls, and are not associated with any specific phenotype. If the deletion is completely contained within an established benign region, enough points are deducted to put it into the benign category. If it overlaps, but additional material is present, no points are awarded or deducted, and the reviewer is encouraged to continue their evaluation. For duplications, one must also consider whether protein coding genes within the established benign region are potentially disrupted. Other supporting information to consider in the evaluation of deletions are haploinsufficiency predictors. This is analogous to the computational data category in the ACMG AMP sequence interpretation guidelines. It's something to consider, but this information alone is not given much weight in the overall evaluation. We suggest a similar approach where a small number of points could be given if multiple predictors, such as the NOMAD PLI and LUF score and the Decipher Haploinsufficiency Index, suggest that at least one gene in your CMV interval could be haploinsufficient. Another type of evidence that we're including in our scoring metric is gene number. So we did this because anecdotally we know that when people see deletions with a large number of genes, they lean toward an interpretation of likely path or path based on that fact alone. But we wanted to know, you know, could that number be defined? When there's no other information available for CMV, when does its sheer size prompt you to classify it as likely path or path? Is it possible to identify a conservative threshold for gene number above which it's unlikely that the CMV would be interpreted as anything other than pathogenic? So in order to select an evidence-based threshold for this particular evidence type, we looked at a set of about 11,000 CMVs in ClinVar that were between 200 KB and 5 megabases in size and had been classified by a clinical laboratory. Here I'm showing you only those CMVs interpreted as benign or pathogenic. This data suggests that there is a point after which pathogenic CMVs appear to kind of pull away from the benign and from the other classifications, so they aren't shown here, in terms of gene count. Based on this information, we've opted to assign points based on gene number, allowing CMVs with high number of genes, so 35 or more in deletions, 50 or more in duplications, to reach a classification of likely pathogenic. If there are no known dosage sensitive or benign genes or genomic regions within your CMV, the next thing you need to do is to consider case-based evidence. Comparable cases could be those CMVs similar in genomic content, or maybe cases of relative relevant variants within single genes. Cases can come from the literature, they can come from public databases, they can come from your own internal lab database. 
our point space system would allow for adjustments of the suggested points based on the nuances of the particular data set used. So for example, if you were going to use data from a public database like Climbar or Decipher or something like that, you should consider the amount of supporting evidence available to allow you to make an independent validation of the claim that was made. If you're going to use your own internal lab data, you should really think about whether or not there are any uh, factors like platform artifacts or biased population, et cetera, which could be affecting the data at a particular interval. Consider awarding higher or lower points within the provider range based on the quality of the data available. In general, however, points may be awarded based on both the specificity of the phenotype observed in the case and the reported inheritance information. So for example, a de novo case that had parental relationships confirmed in a really specific phenotype, such as a particular constellation of birth defects, would score higher than a similar case that had no inheritance information. Or a de novo case with a non-specific genetically heterogeneous phenotype, like autism or developmental delay, would score lower than a de novo case with a more unique, less heterogeneous phenotype, um, such as iris heterochromia and white forelock. Essentially, more weight should be given to cases where you can be more certain that a given phenotype is truly associated with your gene or genomic region of interest and the extent to which other possible causes can be ruled out. For example, a case report in which the authors uh, describe a de novo variant identified on single gene sequencing in a proband with autism might not be a particularly strong piece of evidence, regardless of its de novo status, because autism has been associated with numerous genes, making it nonspecific. Um, the fact that it was found on single gene sequencing tells us that none of those alternatives have been ruled out, and for that we might opt to downgrade. Segregation of a variant among similarly affected family members can lend support to the argument that the variant could be disease causing. It's important to remember, of course, that segregation implicates a locus and not necessarily a particular gene or variant. And while a given variant may be segregating within the family, it might actually be in linkage disequilibrium with the true causative variant. So we recommend a conservative approach here with at least three documented segregations among affected individuals in order to award points for this scoring metric. In order to simplify the process of assessing segregation evidence and in the interest again in being conservative, only those individuals with both the genotype and the phenotype or individuals that are obligate carriers by virtue of their position on the pedigree should be counted as evidence towards segregation. Instances in which the variant appears not to segregate with affected status must be interpreted with caution. Apparent non-segregations can include, uh, one, instances in which another in affected individual in the family is found not to have the variant in question, just this scenario over here. Uh, two, instances in which an unaffected individual is found to have the variant in question, um, which are these two categories over here, which just differ by the specificity the specificity of the phenotype. In scenario one, this category here, before considering this evidence against the pathogenicity of the variant and assigning negative points, we really need to think about whether or not there might be a biologically plausible explanation for what you're seeing, such as the presence of phenocopies. And that kind of scenario is more likely to occur in the setting of disorders that are more common in the general population. For example, something like breast cancer, or disorders that are known to have both genetic and non-genetic causes, so maybe something like cardiomyopathy. Consider downgrading this evidence when phenocopies are a possibility. In the other two scenarios over here, you need to think about whether or not the family member found to have the variant is truly unaffected. This can be hard to determine, particularly in cases that were ascertained through the literature or public databases or even in your own internal lab databases because you're often not able to request additional clarifying information. And truly affected individuals might appear to be unaffected in the context of things like variable expressivity, reduced or age-dependent penetrance, disorders with subtle clinical manifestations, incomplete clinical evaluation, or novel disorders in which the phenotypic spectrum has not yet been well characterized. The specificity of the phenotype plays a role in how confident you can be in a family member's quote-unquote unaffected status, and the recommended point values vary accordingly.
if the variant has been studied as part of a case control study with adequate numbers of cases and controls, the statistical evidence might supersede any individual case report evidence. When evaluating case control studies, just be aware of the methods by which controls were ascertained, as well as the methods by which they were tested. Be aware of biases that might exist if alternative testing platforms were used for cases and controls. CMVs that have been observed in both affected and reportedly unaffected individuals outside of the context of a disorder for which reduced penetrance and variable expressivity are well understood should not be immediately dismissed as potential causative variants without careful consideration. Though a variant might not have been evaluated as part of a formal case control study, it's still possible to gather information about its presence or absence in the general population through resources which catalog copy number variation and reference populations like DGV or NOMAD. The DGV compiles variation observed across multiple studies. These studies are often conducted on different platforms and at different levels of quality. To aid the user in identifying the most high confidence, high quality CMVs observed in reference populations, DGV has developed a curated gold standard data set. The gold standard data set is a subset of the total DGV data that includes only those variants from genome-wide high resolution assays with the most accurate breakpoint resolution that have passed internal quality control metrics. Using these data, DGV can provide more accurate frequency estimates and population distribution information. NOMAD now provides structural variation events obtained from about 14,000 genome sequencing samples with associated frequency information. In general, for the purposes of clinical CMV evaluation, a CMV might be considered common in the general population if it's present at a frequency of 1% or greater in either the DGV gold standard set or NOMAD SV. Consider assigning less weight if the variant is observed in the general population, but at a frequency lower than 1%. And finally, one must also consider the inheritance pattern and the family history of the patient who's being studied. The patient being studied is really essentially another case observation, just like your literature cases, and points can be added in the same manner that they are for those literature cases. Um, they can be added if the deletion segregates at the phenotype in the patient's family or is de novo, and they can be deducted if the deletion is inherited from an apparently unaffected parent, again, determined with caution, or does not segregate with phenotype information, the phenotype observed in the patient's family. If the inheritance information is unavailable or uninformative, points may be given if the patient phenotype is consistent with what's been described in similar cases. Now, I know we went through the scoring metrics very quickly today, but if you'd like to learn more about the updated technical standards, um, ClinGen hosted a multi-part educational web series taking a deep dive into key aspects of the scoring metrics earlier this year. All the webinars were recorded and they're all available at the URL at the bottom of the screen. Slides from each presentation, as well as a suite of examples on an FAQ section, are also available at that URL, so definitely check that out if you would like additional information. In summary, we feel that these proposed changes will provide guidance to help improve consistency and increase transparency in the process of constitutional CMV classification. It's important to remember that this is really just the first iteration. Improvements are definitely going to be needed, and we are going to make adjustments as we gain experience with this process. The system is meant to work in conjunction with your clinical judgment and not to replace it. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the members of our working group, which are listed here, and we can move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Are you there, Kristen? Yes, there I'm you here. Are. Perfect. <laughs> Great. Um, so thanks for that comprehensive overview, Erin. And we're going to take the next 10, 15 minutes to um, go over some frequently asked questions that we've already gathered from our audience. So Kristen, why don't you lead those? OK, let's get started. So for the first question, what are the most commonly reported challenges for people as they adapt to these new guidelines? So one thing that I, that I didn't mention as part of that um, 
that CMV web series that we did earlier in the year, we also had an optional kind of pre and post evaluation um, CMV set where volunteers were able to try to evaluate some CMVs before going through the web series and then do it after. And we're just starting to dig through that data to kind of see you know, where people are having problems, where we might need to do some additional education. And actually, surprisingly, one of the areas where we see a lot of variability is in gene count. So section three, where you're just simply counting up the number of genes in the CMV. And we can see, you know, for people who are looking at the exact CMV, often wildly different gene counts there. So I think that's definitely one of the more unexpected things that we've seen. And, you know, we, I know this can be difficult, especially when genes have different transcripts and the way they are displayed in certain platforms and things like that. But one place I like to go to get the gene count is to decipher, to put in the coordinates there. They have a really nice table of genes and you can sort by protein coding and that gives you a, a count right there. That's great to know. That is sort of unexpected, but good to know that you can get it at decipher. All right, next question. Next question is about category 1A. So category 1A of the guidelines determines whether the CNV covers a protein coding region or other quote unquote known functionally important elements. Can you give us an example of other known functionally important elements? Yeah, sure. So a lot of times when people ask us this question, they are hoping that we can just say, hey, there's a whole nice list of functionally important elements somewhere you can just download that and you'll be all set. And unfortunately, that is not the case. Um, some classic examples of known functionally important elements could be the, the ZRS region that regulates the SHH gene, and that region is actually in an intron of another gene about a megabase away, um, and also the regulatory region of shock. So, you know, we put that in there as kind of a catch-all to be like, hey, if you know something like this exists, don't ignore it, always pay attention to it, but nowhere is there like, a list of these things. It's really just you need to look at the literature, keep in mind the things that you know, use your clinical judgment. And are those regions in the ClinGen dosage sensitivity database? The ZRS one is for sure. I'm not sure off the top of my head about the shocks one, but I'll have to check. Okay, but hopefully over time we'll get them all in there. Exactly. Great. Uh, category 2A assesses complete overlap of a CNV with an established haploinsufficient gene or genomic region, while Category 2H allows the user to employ other haploinsufficiency predictors in their assessment of a gene of interest in the CNV. Can you distinguish between these two categories, and can both categories be applied to the same CNV? Yeah. So category 2A, again, specifically focuses on those genes or genomic regions that were assessed by the ClinGen Dosage Sensitivity Working Group using our evidence-based process. Um, whereas 2H are really focusing on predictors. So things like um, the NOMAD PLI and LUF score or the, the Decipher Haplon Sufficiency Index. So those are just saying, you know, based on um, for NOMAD population data or for um, Decipher, our algorithm of different things we take into consideration, we think these genes are haploinsufficient. And we do not intend for people to double count using that. So if your gene was one that was, you know, rigorously evaluated by ClinGen and found to have a dosage sensitivity score of three, use category 2A, but then don't come behind and also add points because it's also predicted to be haploinsufficient. We already knew it was haploinsufficient, so you can't like double dip. Really 2H is for my gene wasn't evaluated by ClinGen, but I do have some evidence to suggest it might be haploid sufficient, so I'm going to give it a little bump for that. Makes sense. How would you describe the special considerations that go into evaluating CNVs that disrupt partial genes? For example, an intragenic CNV, which you already mentioned a little bit about, or a large CNV with a gene at the breakpoint. And how is that different from evaluating entire gene deletions or duplications? Yeah, so I think when you have an entire gene deletion or duplication, 
it's often a lot easier, right? Because you already know like, hey, I have lost this gene. I know I've lost this gene. So now what comes with losing this gene? Do I have evidence to suggest that that causes a phenotype? Or I know I have an extra copy of this gene. What evidence do I have to say that um, an extra copy causes a phenotype? When you get into intragenic CMVs or CMVs that are disrupting a gene, then you got to add another question on top of that to be like, wait, do I lost this? Have I lost this gene? Does where the breakpoint is? Does that mean I am losing this gene, or is it possible that this is not causing complete loss of the gene? Um, or with duplications, you know, you have to say, you know, do I have any? Uh, do I have evidence to suggest it's in tandem? A lot of times we won't know this information because of testing limitations, and we have to just go with, you know, what what we've seen in the literature, what normally happens, things like that. You know, when you're, again, we, we kind of talked about this in the talk, if you're overlapping the five prime UTR, you need to assess uh, whether or not regulation of the gene is affected um, and whether or not protein coding sequence is affected. And at the three prime, you need to figure out, you know, is this gonna result in something that's gonna escape nonsense mediated decay or do I think that nonsense mediated decay is still gonna occur? nice that that's been broken down in section two of the guidelines and then to have the pvs1 scoring system to follow it up that's good yeah and we did and you know that's one of the nods where we're really trying where we can to align both sequence and copy number variant interpretation so it would not make sense for you know sequence variant people to be using that flow chart and then for copy number variants we tell you to do something else really we're trying again baby steps to get these things more aligned All right, for large CNVs without an established hapoinsufficient or triplet sensitive gene or region, the standard recommends starting with the gene that has the most supporting evidence and gathering data on that gene. How should people prioritize their gene list? This is what everyone wants to know. <laughs> yeah, sure. So whenever I do this, I like to start obviously by searching in ClinGen. So, you know, category two is asking you, you know, if your CMV overlaps a known dosage sensitive gene. But we also evaluate genes in regions where the score is not that high three score. It's two or it's one or it's zero. I still like to look there to see if we've done any evaluation and kind of use where we landed there as a starting point to see, okay, is there anything new since the date that this was last evaluated? If that's not available, um, next I move on to OMIM. I'm looking at those that are um, OMIM morbid specifically. I'll pay attention to those first. And when I look at those, I'm looking to see, okay, which of these are autosomal dominant? Which of these are autosomal recessive? Which ones might seem like ones that I'm more interested in? Does the OMIM entry say what the disease mechanism is? If they tell me it's gain of function right off the bat, I'm probably not gonna pay much attention to that particular gene. Um, and then from there, if the gene has an OMIM entry, at least something, you know, I might look into the literature to find more information about this, et cetera. Kind of going from the top where you might find the most information and kind of working your way down the bottom. It's always the intimidating part when you've got 30 genes staring back at you. Yeah, yeah. And then a lot of times, many of those will you know, just be ones that have OMIM pages but don't have any association with disease. And I definitely always start with the ones that there's at least something out there suggesting it's associated with disease. Um, and then from that, again, when you get down into the slim pickings, then I'll look at like the PLI score and be like, oh, this one, you know, is, looks like it might be hapal insufficient. So let me do a quick literature search to see if I see anything. In most cases, you see nothing. So it, it kind of goes through kind of fast. What part of the guidelines would be the hardest to automate? Well, definitely that would be the section four, which is the literature evaluation section, because um, that's really, you know, requires a lot of manual review and it really requires people's clinical judgment. It requires you to look at a piece of literature, see what they've told you and feel like, yes, I feel like this is a good piece of evidence or no, I don't feel like this is appropriate. Um, and it would be very hard for to teach a computer to do that. I mean, perhaps you will um, in the coming years, but I think there will always be a role for the clinical geneticists to step in there and apply their clinical judgment. Um, one part of that that can lend itself to automation are the 
things like population data. You can definitely instruct a computer to go and pull for you things with a certain threshold from Nomad, for example. So, you know, some pieces are easier than others, but definitely your evaluation of the literature requires your clinical judgment. I agree. All right. It can be difficult to assess whether a given CNV overlaps with previously reported CNVs in the literature or in the databases. How would you define enough overlap between a patient CNV and a previously reported CNV? You're going to laugh because I'm going to sound like a broken record. But again, you know, there's no black and white answer to this. It's always going to boil down to your clinical judgment. The overlap could be as small as a single gene. If there's a single gene in common with these two large CMVs that otherwise look pretty disparate, but they've got this single gene in common and that's the gene that's driving the phenotype, then there's your answer. And then in other cases, the CMVs are going to need to overlap completely before you feel comfortable. And then there are things in between. So I think it's, it's really context dependent. It really takes your critical eye looking at it and say, does this make sense? Is this appropriate? And then I think I've heard you say, and someone actually asked a question about this earlier, but when you're talking more about the benign CNVs, that that's when we think about 70% reciprocal overlap. Is that correct? I think that's a good rule of thumb. I mean, I think you do have to be careful with duplications. Again, I mentioned like just to make sure that, you know, if you have a smaller duplication within a larger benign duplication region that your smaller one isn't potentially disrupting a gene in there, for example. So you just really have to look at it and again, see what makes sense. The guidelines do not support a model of autosomal recessive disease. However, if I'm assessing a patient and I find that the patient has both a CNV and an SNV in the same gene, I need to evaluate the pathogenicity of the CNV. Why can't I use the new guidelines to do this? So that's a really nuanced question. Um, so this, I mean, anybody who's read this guideline that's very dense, it's got a lot of stuff in it kind of as the first pass and, you know, trying to tackle in detail the autosomal recessive conditions um, was difficult at first and is something that, you know, I think will be clearer for us in the future. Um, so one thing that we know is going on right now is that the sequence variant group is now in the process of updating Richards et al. Um, and this is, again, like similar to the CMB guidelines, it's gonna be in conjunction with ClinGen. Um, so both groups are gonna be in very tight communication um, so that you know, those two processes can be aligned. Um, and so we would envision, again, that the two sets of guidelines would merge in the future as technological solutions merge. And it would be ideal to have one platform and one set of guidelines to look at both types of variants. For now, though, if you have a case where the guidelines are relevant, again, use your clinical judgment. If you know you have a pathogenic sequence variant on one allele and you know you have lost that gene on the other allele because of a deletion, you know that a loss of function is the mechanism of disease and you don't really need a guideline to tell you that. You already know that, again, in your clinical judgment. So of course, you know, feel free to call that pathogenic. It gets tricky though when you don't know what's on the other allele where you maybe you've only done an array and you don't know what's happening on the other allele. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the message that we tried to send is hey, if this is something, you know this is a disease-causing gene, you know loss of function is a mechanism, CFTR, for example, don't ignore it, don't not mention it at all, but maybe just mention this again in the section of the report labeled uh, carrier status or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The last question for now, according to the guidelines, are promoters, introns, and other UTRs considered part of the gene, and would they meet criteria for 1A? So I think the spirit of 1A is just to ask yourself, is there anything that is important in this CMB? Um, and we know that there are genes in which the UTR is well characterized, 
are known to be important for gene expression and function. We know there have been variants observed within that UTR that have caused disease. So if you know that, then yeah, go ahead and uh, apply 1A. Um, you know, it's considered a part of the gene, whether or not it's coding sequence, and it does actually meet that uh, criteria. If you don't know that, if you have no reason to believe that some of these other um, elements are important, then you can fall back on that category B. You know, the guidelines can't cover everything. Most, for example, intronic deletions can be skipped, but always apply your professional judgment. If the deletion is really close to the exon and includes maybe a canonical splice site, you'll want to continue analyzing um, to determine whether or not that haploid insufficiency is a mechanism of disease for that gene and if the patient's phenotype is consistent. Um, again, if you had no reason to suspect that, then yeah, you can go with category 1B. But if there's something out there that suggests that, hey, we actually have seen variants like this in this gene, again, don't ignore it. Thanks. That's very helpful. There's a lot of details to remember, so it helps to hear you talk through them. Um, so I think we've covered um, a lot of questions. We're going to pause and jump to the uh, clinical cases that Kristen's going to walk us through um, and then take more questions in the end. Um, if you have submitted your question in the Q&A, uh, we do see them and we'll try and get to them. Uh, Kristen, go ahead. Thanks. As Arit mentioned, my name is Kristen Sund, and I'm a senior scientist at Imagine. I have spent plenty of time performing interpretation of copy number variants over the last 10 years, both as a laboratory genetic counselor and an LGG fellow prior to my certification. I recently joined Imagine because I have a longstanding interest in using the latest technology to find the underlying cause of disease in an undiagnosed patient. I am interested in using artificial intelligence to make labs more efficient, increase the diagnostic yield, and find the right treatment for patients. During my time in the laboratory, I used all of these resources at one time or another to evaluate a CNV, sometimes spending hours on a case with a deletion or duplication that had not been previously seen in my lab. The new ACMG ClinVar guidelines were created in an effort to standardize the field and to quantify the value of evidence. They still require the same level of research and can take time to implement. Imagine aims to make you more efficient by automating tasks that you find repetitive so that you can focus your energy and expertise on finding the critical details that are needed for patient and family. Many of the criteria in the guidelines can be automated. Today, I will show you how our platform handles three CNVs. Through a large duplication, I will show you that the tool can count and prioritize genes, evaluate CNV overlap with disease populations, and automatically compare HPO phenotypes between the patient and disease databases. This duplication is very similar to a case Aaron presented in a webinar, and you can go back to that case for more details at the link indicated. Through a benign CNV, I will show you how the tool can evaluate overlap with common population databases. Through an intragenic deletion, I will show you how the tool calculates the percent of the gene that is affected by the CNV and determines whether the deletion will cause a frame shift or whether it's predicted to cause nonsense mediated decay. All of this information is used in the automated PDS1 score calculation. Now on to the cases. Give me just one second while I share my screen. Can you confirm that you see that? Uh, no, actually, we don't see your screen yet, Kristen. Oh, there we go. There now okay. we do. All right, on the browser before you, you see the analysis page for a patient in the Imagine platform. In the middle of the screen, we have a list of variants, both SNVs and CNVs, but today we will focus on interpretation of the CNVs. To the left, the Analysis Tools tab allows you to review the variants either by manually entered filters, as is seen in this view, or through preset filters, which we will use today. Go. At the right of the screen, you will see a clinical summary with HPO terms for the first case, 
an adult male with cerebellar ataxia, bladder dysfunction, and an abnormal brain MRI. The patient has a known family history of affected relatives in each generation, but no one else was sequenced. For this case, I will choose to learn more about the large duplication on chromosome 5. At the top of the screen, we can see our case number and the number of genes in this region, including non-coding transcripts. On the right, we see the location and size of the CNV, in this case, a 7.9 megabase duplication. As we look down, we begin to see the evidence that is used for the ACMG interpretation. At the top, we have additional information about the variant, including a link to the UCSC and Decipher browsers. Then there's an overview of resources that are used to assess clinical significance. To the right, there's a list of disease genes in the duplications and links to relevant resources like OMIM, CGD, Orphanet, and ClinVar. Under population statistics, we see that the duplication is not found in population databases like Decipher, 1000 Genomes, Nomad Structural Variants, and the Database of Genomic Variants, and is therefore considered private. Then we move on to the Evidence tab to get to the ACMG classification. At the top of this section, you can see the automated ACMG score. There is again a statement about the number of genes in the duplication, but this time only RefSeq protein coding genes are counted per the guidelines. As Aaron mentioned, a challenge of the ACMG guidelines has been calculating the number of genes in a large CNV due to the number of transcripts and the complexity of gene families. Here it is done for you automatically. In addition, the summary will tell you if there is an established ClinGen gene in the region. You can prioritize your gene research using the table below. This table lists all of the genes in the CNV and provides information about each gene. From left to right, we have the gene name, the percent of the gene covered by the CNV, and the percent of the CNV covered by the gene. We use ClinGen dosage sensitivity data to indicate whether the gene is triplosensitive or haploinsufficient. We also pull in data from two haploinsufficiency predictors, PLI from NOMAD, and the HI index from Decipher. Additional information about the canonical transcripts is found at the right of the table. A quick look at the table indicates the presence of one triplosensitive gene, LMNV1. The red color of the score indicates pathogenicity. Below the table, if you click through the sections, you can see the decision that was made by the automation. For section one, this duplication clearly contains protein coding genes. Section two is the most important piece of evidence for this case because it indicates that the duplication overlaps with a triplosensitive gene. Section three indicates the duplication, duplication has zero to 34 genes. Section four is the literature review section and it was not automated for this case. However, if you perform a literature review and would like to add information about a case, you can edit it. When you click on the pencil, you will see a description of the criteria. Then you can type in a summary about an article of interest. You can either use the designated point value or you can change the point value and it will be added to the total score. All sections can be edited according to the user's clinical judgment. You can always save or revert manual changes. Section five assigns 0.1 additional points because although inheritance information is not available, the patient HPO terms are consistent with the OMIM description of the disease. Using my clinical judgment, I have the flexibility to edit this criteria. Since I think the phenotype is highly specific for this patient, he has ataxia, autonomic dysfunction evident by loss of bladder control, a brain imaging abnormality, and a familial inheritance pattern that is seen in autosomal dominant leukodystrophy associated with LMNV1, I can choose 5H and increase the added point value. Once I have completed my review, I can summarize the information about the variant and make the final call by adding a pathogenic tag. Oops. 
In a small study, this automated component saved expert geneticists up to 90% of time when the CNV did not require a literature review, and up to 50% of time when the CNV did require a literature review. The second CNV I want to share with you is a benign CNV, shown here as an example of how we can automate parts of Section 4 in the guidelines. In addition to the large duplication, the patient had a small deletion on chromosome 11. For this deletion, we are going to skip straight to the ACMG interpretation. There is one protein coding gene in this region. The gene has not been reviewed for dosage sensitivity by ClinGen, so we focus on the HI predictions. A gene with a PLI score less than 0.1 in an HI index in the 90s is predicted to be loss of function tolerant, so we are less concerned right away. Then we run through the guideline categories. Section one shows the deletion contains a protein coding gene. No tags are chosen for section two because there's no evidence for haploinsufficiency causing disease. For section three, the deletion co contains one gene. As a reminder, section four focuses on literature review and is very difficult to automate. However, we can automate 4O based on the presence of the CNV in a common population. If we jump back to the population statistics, we see that this CNV is found in greater than 1% of the African American population in NOMAD, including 23 homozygotes, and is therefore scored as a minus one. With no additional information available for this patient, the automated score of minus one allows this to be designated as benign. Moving on to patient two. Patient two is a nine-year-old female who presented with short stature, delayed bone age, and fatigue. There was no family history of similar features and a trio was sequenced. Testing identified a 7.9 KB deletion on chromosome 1. The deletion contains exons 3 to 6 of a gene called LHX4. We can immediately see that this gene is associated with short stature and pituitary dysfunction. The quality is high and the deletion is not commonly found in the population database. In the ACMG classification section, we see that the automated score is a 1. A quick glance at the table shows that LHX4 is the ClinGen haploinsufficient gene. However, the deletion only covers 16.3% of the total nucleotides, so this is an intragenic deletion. The application of the guidelines for an intragenic deletion in Section 2 can get quite complex, and a lot of work has gone into the automation here. Even though the gene is a ClinGen dosage sensitive gene, the deletion does not cover the entire gene, so criteria 2A does not apply. Instead, this intragenic deletion meets the criteria for 2E, which can receive a range of scores from 0 to 0 0.9. By hovering over the gene CDs, I can get some additional relevant information about the deletion, including what percent of the coding nucleotides are deleted, in this case, 56.9%, whether or not this deletion would cause a frame shift, it would cause a frame shift in this case, and whether or not the deletion is expected to cause nonsense mediated decay. It does in this case. Following the ClinGen Working Group on PDS1 specifications, we have implemented the logic tree that Erin showed in her presentation to assign these scores where possible. For this case, we know that this is a multi-exon deletion that disrupts the reading frame and is predicted to undergo nonsense mediated decay, which would give it an additional 0.9 points. Also, since this was a de novo deletion, 0.1 points were automatically added in section five. With this information, I can return to my variant interpretation box at the top, add in information about why I think this deletion is disease causing and tag it as pathogenic. All right, you're gonna take it back, right? Okay. 
In summary, we've been able to automate a large part of the CNV guidelines through gene counting and prioritization, PVS1 scoring, consolidation of critical resources, and automated comparison of the CNV and phenotype to disease and population databases. This saves you time on individual cases and saves the lab time on the overall workload, allowing you to focus on places where human expertise is irreplaceable. This new component is one more addition to our platform, which uses artificial intelligence to pinpoint causative variants while providing the supporting evidence and also includes automation of the guidelines for smaller variants. We are committed to continual modification and improvement of this automation as more guidelines are published. Our aim is to help geneticists and genetics laboratories increase their efficiency and scale their testing operations with the ultimate goal to decrease the length of the diagnostic odyssey in patients. Thank you, Erin. Um, unfortunately, we ran out of time, so we will handle your questions offline, but I am sharing a quick poll. I'd be happy if you guys can fill it out. Um, just before you go. Great, I see answers coming in. Um, thank you, Erin, for a very informative session and collaborating on our extensive FAQ. We appreciate your time and I'm sure the audience benefited from your expertise. Thank you, Kristen, for walking us through the clinical cases and showing us where and how automation can save time. Um, we'll catch up on the unanswered questions on our blog or in person. And thank you everyone for attending. Have a great week.